All right, so uh, let's get into uh, tonight. Tonight we are walking in the Word Wednesdays. We thank God for all of you who tune in faithfully on Wednesday nights, who join us uh, in this awesome book study, this journey that we've been on uh, in the book, uh, True Revival. And so I'm going to uh, share my screen now uh, so that everyone can uh, see what I see. And uh, let me pull it up, let me see here. And uh, I hope and pray that you all have had an awesome, awesome uh, Wednesday. I know that uh, I've had I had some challenges today, but I am grateful and thankful uh, that I can get my Wednesday night fill up. Lord knows I need it. So I am uh, checking our chat now. I'm checking our chat. Now, just to see any prayer requests that have come in, we're praying for Kim. Uh, she has surgery on tomorrow. Uh, any others that may have any prayer requests, you know that you can uh, put it in the comments on Facebook. You can email us. Uh, uh, you can direct message us on Facebook. You can uh, post your prayer requests on our website, www bereansdahouston.org uh, and we will um, add you to the prayer list. We have an awesome prayer ministry here at Berean and uh, tonight we want to uh, lift up those um, in our families, uh, those on our jobs, those uh, connected to us. We want to pray for them. We want to pray for Luis. We also have some individuals who are seeking to study with us, so we're excited that we have uh, been in our Bible worker trainings and we have uh berean bible workers who are uh, able to uh, lead individuals in studies and so tonight uh we want to um be prayerful for even those who will uh come as a result of our evangelistic effort but uh, it is now 7 10 i said i was going to start at 7 10 on the dot and i may take those 10 minutes back at the end of our call tonight but we are again thankful for those who are in the Zoom room. Uh, but and we also want to uh, pray for those who are watching us via Facebook. I see a prayer for Luis. Uh, he's searching for God, and we again want to uh, just keep those uh, those prayer requests coming in the chat. And I will acknowledge any more uh, at the end of the call. But at this time, uh, let us go to Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you, thank you, thank you for another day, another opportunity, God, to uh, cast our cares on you. Lord, I can only speak for myself. I know that uh, there were some challenges. Uh, there are some uh, interesting uh, happenings uh, in my day, but I know, God, that you are in control. And God, when I trust in you, I find strength to uh, get over, get through any of those challenges that are presented. So if there's anyone, God, tonight who are, is watching us live on Facebook, who is a part of our fellowship at Berean, God, who uh, had experienced challenges in any way this, uh, this the, today or throughout this week, God, we just lift them up to you. God, we have a dear sister, Kim, who is... Uh, having surgery on tomorrow, God, we want you to be, we pray that you'll be with uh, the doctors, the care providers, all those who will uh, be in charge of her. God, we pray for her family, and we pray, God, for a speedy recovery after surgery. God, we lift up a brother Luis. Uh, he is searching for God, and we uh, lift up all of our students, God, their families. Uh, I'm a teacher, God, and we just ask that you be uh, with all of our young people, God. There are so many challenges that they face on a daily basis, God, things that we never had to experience. So, God, we pray that you would just put a hedge of protection around them, God. You promised it in your word, and we intercede on their behalf tonight. We lift up every family and friend that's connected to our ministry, God, that you would just bless them in a special way, that they will feel your presence as they draw near to you. And God, even if they aren't drawing to you, God, we know that you will leave the 99 behind to go after that one. So God, we just thank you for the love you have for us. And tonight we pray that as we study this uh, phenomenal book, God, as we try and close out this uh, phenomenal book, God, we pray that you would uh, shed light 
on uh, the things that we share tonight, that we are able to uh, gain some deeper understanding of what it means to truly be converted, what it means, God, to truly hold on and fight for uh, our, our fight in this struggle, God, uh, of to grow in you. And so, God, we thank you. We love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we uh, want to be mindful of our Revelation of Hope seminar being led out by Pastor Kerman Jones. Uh, he will be with us live and in the flesh at our church at 2119 St. Emmanuel uh, for uh, a, a few weeks uh, as we uh, journey through the book of Revelation as we seek hope. Uh, and a book of prophecy. And so we uh, have a dynamic teacher, uh, preacher teacher in Ker Pastor Kerman Jones. So uh, please invite your friends, your family, your loved ones, those who may be searching like Brother Luis, who may be looking uh, for truth. Uh, God, uh, we, we just pray that you guys would, uh, would, would reach out to family members and friends and let them know that uh, there's going to be some teaching going on on Sundays, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays um, in a very short while, in the next week or so. Uh, and so uh, on, the 10th, on the 23rd of October, we'll kick off on a Sunday evening at 7. It's going to be each night at 7 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. And so we're uh, looking for our Berean nights to uh, not only be live on Facebook, but to be uh, in the building, bring a friend, again, bring your family members, uh, tell them to tune in. If they can't make it in person, we have, um, an, uh, we have an awesome time planned for those who uh, are in attendance. Also, we want to uh, keep putting a plug in for our Berean uh, app, uh, Berean SDA Church. You search that in your app store in, uh, or Google Play, and you can find our church uh, app. And you uh, just go ahead, download that app into your phone and click on Bible studies, click on True Revival, and you'll be able to have a PDF version or an online version of the book that we have been journeying through for the last few weeks. And so uh, make sure that you uh, add yourself to the app, update it with as much information as you feel comfortable updating it with so that we can stay connected to you. Just another way we uh, are using technology to stay connected with our uh, loved ones and Bereanites. All right, all right. So tonight we're going to get into True Revival, uh, chapters eight, nine, and 10. We want to uh, hop into the book uh, and get through uh, each of these last remaining chapters. We wanted to uh, try to finish up tonight and move on uh, and get as we prepare for our revival that will be taking place on Wednesday nights on, in person and that will be a live stream. So uh, next week we will, uh, I, I don't know what direction we'll go, but I'm sure there'll be a season of prayer for those individuals who uh, are going to be in attendance uh, at our revival. Uh, first and foremost, we are always start off with just a little background as to who our writer is, Ellen G. White. She is the most translated American author Although her formal schooling ended at age nine, her total literary output is approximately 100,000 pages. More than 100 books have been published from her writings. And as we journey through this uh, little book, True Revival, we will uh, kind of see some of those writings that were compiled to make up this a dynamic book. Uh, she wrote books on numerous topics, including spirituality, parenting, social issues, health, and financial counsel. Guided by the Holy Spirit, she exalted Jesus and pointed to scripture as the basis for her faith. The Smithsonian Magazine in 2014 named her one of the 100 most significant Americans of all time. And that is just a little bit about uh, Ellen G. White. How do I approach this book study? As we've been journeying through the book, I always start out with these little five reminders for you. Maybe you, uh, tonight's the first time that you're hearing about this and first time that you are uh, aware that we've been going through this book. We're now at the close of the book, chapters eight and nine, but in your personal time, you can always pick up this book. You can go to it, uh, pick it up from us at the church or you can visit it online. And as you journey through a book or any spiritual, any spiritual book and for that matter, you want to uh, begin that uh, that study with personal prayer. Take some time to pray and ask God to show you what it is that you can gain 
from uh, studying uh, the, uh, particular writing, especially as we journey through Sister White's writings. Uh, you want to have your pen and paper ready. There's always something to highlight, something to underscore, something to jot down in your margins. And so you want to have pen and paper so that your study is, uh, in fact, indeed a study. A lot of times, uh, most of the times, almost 90% of everything she says is going to be backed up by scripture. So you want to write those scriptures down and uh, go to them in your own private study, because it, as uh, we study together, you can be uh, illuminated. You can see more that you've never seen before in some of the uh, texts that you read as you uh, study the Bible, uh, as you read uh, any spiritual writing, but especially uh, inspired writings by uh, Sister White. Uh, I have in quotation marks number three, some Epsom salt. Because as I read this book, I was, uh, I'm telling you the word, the conviction of the Holy Spirit was on my toes as it relates to uh, being uh, a, a truly converted, being uh, sold out for Christ. Uh, those things uh, can challenge us in our sanctif in that sanctification process, amen. As we are developing Christian character, um, sometimes it's painful to hear the truth, and you might need to soak your feet, your spiritual feet, in some Epsom salt tonight. I also put here number four, when I'm studying Sister White, I always have my dictionary ready. Uh, even though her schooling ended at age nine, some of the words she uses sometimes we don't use in our everyday vernacular, and you need to know, hey, what does this word mean? So I, I'm not ashamed to say I pick up my uh, my, my dictionary to study uh, to, to as I study along with her writing. Uh, and finally, digest the material by questioning each sentence you read. Uh, it's very, very important that you uh, leave each study with a deeper understanding. Question it. Question, why would she say this? Or why would the, uh, the author put this in this perspective? And, and then you look at scripture to make sure it matches up. So you want to digest what you're reading and question every sentence because that's how you get the very most out uh, out of your uh, uh, out of your study, and so uh, that's how I've approached this this book. All right, so uh, we're gonna get into each chapter. Each chapter has subsections, and so uh, tonight. Uh, not as in weeks past, I've had each um, slide with many with a little, little excerpt that you'll be able to read along with me. But I did not have the time this week to uh, just go through all of that uh, to throw, go through the book and add it to the slide. So uh, forgive me for that. But you will be able to if you have your copy of the book, if you have uh, access to a computer, you can always pull up each chapter and kind of read some of the things that we uh, share out tonight. Uh, the first subsection in chapter eight, chapter eight's title is, It's Still a Fight. What Sin Has Done, uh, It Takes Perseverance, is the next subsection. There's a science to it, no time to lose, constant de dependence, truth or trivia, and do I have the answer? And so those are the subsections in chapter eight. In chapter nine, chapter nine is titled Safeguarding the New Experience, Safeguarding the New Experience. And it says the contest following the contest following the revival, the peril of confusing the spirit's work with fanaticism, easy ways to lose the blessing, danger of light becoming darkness, spiritual victory over uh, of spiritual victory, loss of the passions for games, uh, the child of God, a laborer with God. Was the blessing cherished? And that should be a question mark there. Was the blessing cherished? A blessing turned into a curse? Be exceedingly careful and the sin of rejecting evidence. And then finally, chapter 10. In chapter 10, chapter 10 is uh, unique because as she uh, as she outlines or late, uh, can it concludes this book as the as the, those who compiled this book of all her writings they decided to close this book with special appeals made in public ministry and so there were a lot of uh different subsections in chapter 10 uh moments where she had meetings in uh norway uh, me uh, meetings uh in other foreign countries but uh i wanted to focus on the very last one in chapter 10 and is a response at the general conference in 1909 i feel like it encapsulates every Everything that she wanted to share as it relates to those special appe appeals made uh, in her public ministry. All right. 
So let's get into it. Let's get into it. Chapter eight, chapter eight begins, and I'll go back so you can see what the uh, subsections. Again, I don't have a, uh, a slide for each subsection, but what is sin? Uh, in my book, it's page 65. And one of the things that we start out with, and as I read, I want you to uh, follow along with me again, and as we read it, so that you can kind of get an understanding of what she meant by, what they meant by this title, is still a fight. Uh, she says, under what sin has done, the infinite value of the sacrifice, this is uh, paragraph two, the infinite value of the sacrifice required for our redemption reveals the fact that sin is a tremendous evil. Through sin, the whole human organism is deranged. The mind is perverted. The imagination corrupted. Sin has degraded the faculties of the soul. Temptations from without find an answering cord within the heart, and the feet turn imperceptibly toward evil. As the sacrifice in our behalf was complete, so our restoration from the defilement of sin is to be complete. No act of wickedness will the law of God excuse. No unrighteousness can escape its condemnation. The ethics of the gospel acknowledge no standard but the perfection of the divine character. And so as I read these words uh, dealing with this subtopic, what sin has done, we must remember uh, that and what I think what Sister White's trying to uh, encourage us to be mindful of is that when we take sin lightly, when we take sin lightly, we set ourselves up for uh, uh, we set ourselves up for failure in a lot of ways because we don't look at sin uh, as this uh, how does she put it this um, this perversion of the of the mind this corrupt this uh the, the the ability to corrupt our every thought right and 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 as she writes she's reminding us that the more we focus on uh the more we allow sin to creep into our life the easier it is for satan to lead us off the path that god has uh, has let or has uh, made for us or has called us to and so remember uh we talked about this throughout the book and one of the things that she reminds us uh throughout this uh book true revival is that sanctification is a process. And so she gets into that in the next subsection. It says, it takes perseverance. It says, wrongs cannot be righted, nor can reformation in conduct be made by a few feeble intermittent efforts, right? You just can't, you know, just because I go to church on Saturday, just because I return a faithful tithe and offering, these these efforts, these uh, these 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 shows of Christian community, so to speak, uh, is that's is not enough there, right? She goes on to say, character building is the work not of a day nor of a year, but of a lifetime. The struggle for conquest over self, for holiness and heaven, is a lifelong struggle. Now you now you get why she they might have titled this. It's still a fight, right? You, uh, it's a struggle in us every day. Every time uh, my, my dad used to say, "Every time my feet hit the floor, I'm in trouble." You know, <laughs> every time we wake up out of the bed and roll over and get uh, say our prayers and get off to our start, we have we are prone to trip up. We are prone to go left. We are prone to clap back, as our pastor would say. We we are prone to to fall victim to the to the wiles of Satan. And so it says that the struggle for conquest over self for holiness in heaven is a lifelong struggle. Without continual effort and constant activity, there can be no advancement in the divine life, no attainment of the victor's crown. And so it's important that we see this. Uh, uh, there's another thing on page 66 that I highlighted here. It says the way of return can be gained only by hard fighting, inch by inch, hour by hour, in one moment. Uh, in one moment, by a hasty, unguarded act, we may place ourselves in the power of evil, but it requires more than a moment to break the feathers and attain a holier life. The purpose may be formed, uh, may be formed the work begun, but its accomplishment will require toil, time, perseverance, patience, and sacrifice. 
And so as we, as we, uh, she goes on to talk about how Paul said, I die daily. I crucify my flesh daily. This was a daily act, this daily walk, this personal relationship with God that we have, it takes some perseverance. It takes some reminders to ourselves that, hey, I can't do what I used to do. I can't hang with those people anymore. I can't sit at that table. I can't go have lunch with so-and-so because I know all she's going to do is gossip about uh, everybody in the office, right? I, I got to I gotta guard myself from opportunities to uh, fall into uh, the Satan's traps. And they're all around us. He knows us. Uh, I, as I read the great controversy, it talks about how, you know, the sa Satan studies us. He knows the human mind. He knows our character. And he is setting us up every day. He's putting some booby traps out there on our, on our way. And if we're unguarded, we, we will fall. And so we have to Right. And so uh, some encouragement comes to, uh, to us in the next subsection. There, there's a science to it. There is a science of Christianity to be mastered, a science much deeper, broader, higher than any human science as the heavens are higher than the earth. The mind is to be disciplined, educated, trained, for we are to do service for God in ways that are not in harmony with inborn inclination. Heredity and cultivated tendencies to evil must be overcome. Often the education and training of a lifetime must be discarded that one may become a learner in the school of Christ. Our hearts must be educated to become steadfast in God. We are to form habits of thought that will enable us to resist temptation. We must learn to look upward. The principles of the word of God, principles that are as high as heaven, that compass eternity, we are to understand in their bearing upon our daily life. Every act, every word, every thought, is to be in accord with these principles. All must be brought into harmony and subject to Christ. The precious graces of the Holy Spirit are not developed in a moment. Courage, fortitude, meekness, faith, unwavering truth or trust in God's power to save are acquired by the experience of years, by a life of holy endeavor and firm adherence to the right the children of God are to seal their destiny. And as she, she writes these words to encourage us, this, these books uh, are meant to encourage us in our walk, to encourage us in our faith. And what, uh, what Sister Wright reminds us of in, this, in chapter eight, in this chapter eight, it's still a fight, is that there is a science, a trusting in the word of God, trusting in his power to help us overcome sin. She goes on to say in the section, no time to lose. We have no time to lose. We know not how soon our probation may close. At the longest, we have but a brief lifetime here. You see how she said that? A brief lifetime. You know, you know your live 70 years, your live 50 years is a drop in the bucket to what God it, it has for us in eternity. All right. It, and so we, we do not have time to lose. It says, um, uh, and we, we know not how soon this arrow of death may strike our hearts. We know not how soon we may be called to give up the world and all its interests. Eternity stretches before us. The curtain is about to be lifted, but a few short years and for everyone now numbered with the living, the mandate will go forth. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Are we prepared? Are we prepared? Have we considered that when we live our life, when we do the work of God with a sense of urgency, that's why we have this Revelation of Hope uh, seminar, not so that we can uh, be cute and or that we can bring in folks and, and to sing and bring in preachers to preach and, 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 and pass out flyers in a the neighborhood. There is a, a point to it. And a point to it is to remind folks that your time is not forever, that there is, but we live in, I mean, we, we're living in the last days. And if we don't have a sense of urgency about our walk, about our faith, about our, our, our commitment to God, we can fall victim to Satan's greatest deception. And that deception, that deception is, I can get it right tomorrow. 
This is the word that we need to share with our family and friends. This is the word that we need to share with those under our roof. This is the word that we need to tell the man and the woman in the mirror is I don't have time to play church. It's the time is now to get serious about your relationship with God. And that is all this reminder in no time to lose in a subsection, no time to lose was all about. A constant dependence. She goes on to say, man's great danger is in being self-deceived indulging self-sufficiency and thus separating from God, the source of his strength. Our natural tendencies, unless corrected by the Holy Spirit, you, you see what she says there, right? Because you, a lot of times we struggle and we think that it's up to us to do this. No, it is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit that comes to, to live within us when we confess Christ, when we confess him, and when we say that, yes, I believe that he's the son of God and he died for my sins. And because he died for my sins, I have an opportunity to the tree of life. It, when we confess Christ, the, the Holy Spirit takes resonance in our hearts and he begins to work on us and change our filthy ways into uh, so that we can be fitted for a garment of righteousness. And so it goes on. she goes on to say, unless corrected by the Holy Spirit of God, have in them the needs, the seeds of moral death. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we cannot resist the unhallowed effects of self-indulgence, self-love, and temptation to sin. In order to receive help from Christ, we must realize our need. We must have a true knowledge of ourselves. It is only he who knows himself to be a sinner that Christ can save. I, I love that line and I have it highlighted in my book and I hope you highlight it too because yeah, that is a powerful statement. We have to know ourselves. You, you know what you like. You, you know what, what tripped you up. You know what you used to be and you don't want to go back to that. And, the, and Sister White even reminds us in other uh, writings uh, to, to not dwell on too long the, the sins of your past, to not give glory to the life that you used to live, but glory in the strength that the uh, uh, Holy Spirit provides to overcome those things. There is a, a need for a constant dependence on God. Let's move on because I want to get us to chapter uh, 10 before our time is up here tonight. And we see in the next uh, subsection, truth or trivia. Let's see what, uh, what they meant by this subsection, truth or trivia. We cannot turn away from a thousand topics. Uh, we cannot turn away from a thousand topics that invite attention. There are matters that consume time and arouse inquiry, but end in nothing. The highest interests demand the close attention and energy that are so often given to comparatively insignificant things. Accepting new theories does not in, an, in itself bring new life to the soul. Even an acquaintance with facts and theories uh, import in themselves is of little value unless put to a practical use. We need to feel our responsibility to give our souls food that will nourish it and stimulate spiritual life. The question for us to study is, what is truth? The truth that is to be cherished, loved, honored, and obeyed. The devotees of science have been defeated and disheartened in their efforts to find out God. What they need to inquire at this time is what is the truth that will enable us to win the salvation of our souls. Something that I learned uh, just this last week that uh, the year of 1844, the year 1844 is a, a, is a year that is marked with great disappointment in uh, the study of Adventism, right? Uh, 1844. But 1844, in that year, in that time, in the time that Sister White was doing ministry, uh, 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 several of, the of these new ideas came about socialism, communism. Just think if you read history, I'm a history teacher. If you read the history books, 1844 and that time period from 1844 to about 1894, uh, all these things were happening at a rapid pace. Uh, new technology was coming around, uh, new ideas and thoughts, the second enlightenment, some call it. All these things were, were happening and people were coming into a, a, trying to understand uh, the world around them and, and, and have a deeper understanding of how people relate to each other. So all these ideas were out and about at that time. And so as she was writing this, she was reminding Christians, and it's still applicable today, over 150 years later, that there are so many new little things popping up. 
you know what I mean? I, I, I can't go over anybody's house these days and I'm just without seeing some sage burning or, 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 or some crystals on a counter or, or all kinds of stuff. You know, these things are popping up because people are starting their longing to have that void filled with anything that makes sense to them. And so the question that we have to continually ask ourselves as we are presented with all these different theories of new age uh, religions and new age ideas that there is no hell and God is too merciful to send someone to hell. All these kind of new ideas that are popping up. She's reminding us that it's not new. The truth has stood forever. And it's our, it's our responsibility to study the word of God for ourselves so that we can know the truth from error, that we can know how to lead someone into a deeper relationship with Christ so that they are not swayed uh, by all the different uh, ideologies that pop up as we journey with Christ. Uh, you know, that's that that is the, the challenge that we'll see in chapter nine is what happens after we come into this sense of revival when we uh, have this uh, these these awesome tip revivals and these awesome uh, baptisms and we see folks come in the pool and leave out the back door. What happened is they may have not had a deep enough roots. We're not deep enough in the truth of God, who his character is. And so it's so vitally important that we understand truth and can distinguish truth from trivia. And that's all she was trying to tell us in the section truth or trivia. I want to keep us going because we have about 10 more sections that I want to get to in order to close out our, our book tonight. And so I'm going to try to do that uh, with our time, re our, our remaining time. It says, do I have the answer? Is our last subsection of the chapter eight, it's still a fight. And she says, do I have the answer? That's the topic. And the question that she poses in this subsection is, what think ye of Christ? This is the all important question. What think ye of Christ? Do you receive him as a personal savior? To all who receive him, he gives power to become sons of God. Christ revealed God to his disciples in a way that performed in their hearts a special work such as he desires to do in our hearts. There are many who, in dwelling too largely upon theory, have lost sight of the living power of the Savior's example. They have lost sight of him as the humble, self-denying worker. What they need is to behold Jesus. Daily, we need the fresh revealing of his presence. We need to follow more closely his example of self-renunciation and self-sacrifice. We need the experience that Paul had when he wrote, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. She quotes Galatians 2 and 20. The knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ expressed in character is an exaltation above everything else that is esteemed on earth or in heaven. It is the very highest education. It is the key that opens the portals of the heavenly city. The knowledge it is God's purpose that all who put on Christ shall possess. And so do I have the answer? Do you really know Christ? And I like what she says. We get caught up sometimes in theory, you know, we, we want, we want to, to debate and to give folks our opinion or what we think or our stands. And, and, and we are not so, we're not as quick as we ought to be to give individuals who are seeking uh, to give them Christ, to give them Christ. You know, I don't, I don't want to debate with you. I don't want to argue with you. I want to love you. I want to show you through my self-denial, through my self-sacrifice, through cutting away at those things that I, those tethers, allowing the Holy Spirit to break the yoke of bondage on my life, allowing him to remind me that there is a, a, a cost to this, to this walk with Christ. You know, one thing my friend said, I, I was studying when I was, um, I, I was at Oakwood. I, I wasn't a student at Oakwood. I was a student at Alabama a and Many of you know that story, but uh, he's a young, he was a preacher, a young preacher then, but now he's an old preacher. Uh, uh, I'll get, I'll put his name out there. Uh, minister, uh, Pastor Jason O'Rourke. He told me one time, he said, James, Christ is not convenient. Christ is not convenient. He's convicting and converting. Christ is not convenient. He's convicting and converting. He told me that and it, and, it, and, it, and it sat with me and I can call it and remember it even today because it reminds me that this walk with Jesus is going to require some sacrifice. 
it's gonna it's gonna hurt sometimes. You're gonna need to put that your feet in the Epsom salt when you look at who Christ is and who how filthy and how raggedy I am, how sorry, how trifling I am. I need the power of God to help me become truly his son, to truly shape my character into the image of Christ. And if we are to experience true revival, then we need to have that, re that realization. Also, so moving on into chapter nine, like I told you, we're going to try to finish out this book tonight. And there are 10 subsections in chapter nine. And this chapter is titled Safeguarding the New Experience. It's on page 71. If you have a little book we handed out at the church, it says the contest following the revival. It says, after the outpouring of the Spirit of God in Battle Creek, it was proved in the college that at time of great spiritual light is also a time of uh, corresponding spiritual darkness. Satan and his legions of satanic agencies are on the ground, pressing their powers upon every soul to make of none effect the showers of grace that have come from heaven to revive and quicken the dormant energies into, uh, into decided action to impart that which God has imparted. Have all the many souls been enlightened, gone to work at once uh, to impart to others that which God had given to them for that very purpose, more light would have been given, more power bestowed. God does not give light merely for one person, but that he may diffuse light and God be glorified. Its influence is felt. And as we look at uh, this, 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 this subsection, the contest following the revival, we need to be mindful as we begin to do our track attacks, as we begin to go into the neighborhoods and hang door hangers and, and, uh, and, and make commercials and encourage in individuals to attend our nightly revival. We need to be more concerned about what happens after the preacher goes back to his church, what happens after they come up out of the watery grave. We need to be focused as a church, as a body of believers to make sure that we are prepared to help individuals remain connected to God because as she states in the in the first subsection of chapter nine that we must safeguard this new experience for those who come into it and not only for those who are new to the faith but for those who have been walking with God for a mighty long time we need to make sure that we stay connected to the vine because we cannot do anything apart from Christ and Christ has empowered us to lead others into that that deeper relationship with God. If I was in church, I know I hear somebody say amen because it is a reminder to us tonight as we study this great book that if we are to experience true revival, our, our mindset has to shift from I'm, it's it's a, from a, a, almost a self-centered saint of a salvation and start to look and re be reminded that God gave you light so that you can bring light to his truth in the lives of others. Amen. Thank you. And I saw somebody in the eight. I know that's an amen in the chat. I'm not going to read it right now because that would throw me off. But I know that's an amen and a hallelujah in the chat. It says, peril of confusing the spirits work with fanaticism. Let's go to, let's read what she says. It says, uh, she goes on to say, uh, starting, I'm going to start right in this. Uh, I'm going to start at the last, last paragraph. I mean, I'll go the second to the last paragraph on page 73 if you're in the book. And again, I apologize that you don't see these words on your screen tonight. But the peril of confusing the spirit's work with fanaticism, it says, it is an easy matter to idle away, talk, and play away the spirit's influence. To walk in the light is to keep moving onward in the direction of light. If the one thus becomes negligent and inattentive and does not watch unto prayer, if he does not lift the cross and bear the yoke of Christ, if his love of amusements and strivings for the mastery absorb his power or ability, then God is not made the first and best and last in everything. And Satan comes in to act his part in playing the game of life, uh, of life for his soul. He can play much more earnestly than they can play and make deep lay plots for the ruin of the, of the soul. Uh, she goes on to say, the results after the working of the Spirit of God in Battle Creek, Creek are not because of fanaticism, but because those who were blessed did not show forth the praises of him who called them out of darkness into the marvelous light. And when the earth is lightened with the glory of God, some will not know what it is and from whence it came because they misapply and misinterpret the spirit shed upon them. God is a jealous God. Of his own glory, he will not, uh, he will not honor those who dishonor him. 
Some persons living in the light ought to have instructed these souls, young and experienced, to walk in the light after they have received the light. Because, you know, when we come, you know, like they said, you know, you, you, you just come off the mountaintop. You know, you remember what it was when you were first baptized, when you first came into the church, when you first came into a true knowledge of who Christ was and what his standard was for your life. You were you were on fire for him. And, uh, and along the way, you kind of started to look around and you saw that everyone else didn't have a sense of urgency. And it was uh, a more better to make sure you have a new suit every Sabbath than it was to make sure that you were studying to show yourself approved before God. And you began to slip into this attitude of being a fan of God. I I'm just a fan. You know, I I'm not a, a disciple. I'm not a disciple maker. I'm just uh, here to, to show up and wait for his return. You know what I mean? You like that, 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 uh, that servant who buried their, their, their talent in the ground saying, Hey, I knew you were coming back, Jesus. So I'll just, here I am, take me home. And he's saying, depart from me. I never knew you. Because in the time that I gave you, you did nothing. You were a fan and you confused the work that I was doing in your life and the work that I was doing in the lives of others as something that was a short lived or just a momentary thing. But in this lifelong process, it's, it's, so, it's vitally important that we take the mind of disciple maker and realize that I have to be bringing someone else along with me. I cannot go to, I don't want to go to heaven by myself. I want everybody that I know to be in heaven with me. So it's my responsibility to, to live my life in such a way that will encourage individuals to come to know Christ as I have, not as a fan, but as someone who is dedicated to the work of bringing individuals into the knowledge of who Christ is in their life. Amen. And so tonight, I hope you're getting it. I hope you I hope you feel it like I feel it because I get I'm easily excited after reading this and understanding that I've been wrong about my approach. I've been too lackadaisical in my ministry. I've been too iffy and wishy-washy when it comes to the things that God has called me to. And so it's it's vitally important, no matter if you hold a position in the church or not, it's vitally important that you recognize yourself as a disciple of God. This is God's church. You you know, I, I, let me put a plug right here. I, I'm not an elder at Berean. I'm God's elder. <laughs> I, 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 you're, not a, you're not a prayer ministry leader at Berean. You're God's prayer ministry leader. You, you're not the pastor of Berean. You're a pastor for God. You know what I mean? Th th this is who we serve. We serve God. You know, it, it's not, we, we don't have, this is not a social club where I'm trying to see how many of my friends I can get to leave their church and come to my church. No, I, 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 we all in this thing together. And it's our responsibility to begin to live our lives in such a way that we're drawn men to Christ. And I don't want to run out of time. I said I was going to take my 10 minutes back that I started out. I started at 710. So I'm going to end this thing at 810. Please forgive me if you uh, had something on the stove because I, I got to finish this tonight. Easy ways to lose the blessing. Easy ways to lose a blessing. Let's keep on going because I, I'll, I'll stay. I'll stay too long. I'm, I'm looking for what I have highlighted here. Uh, skip down with me if you're in your book. I'm on page 74 now, and I'm in that second paragraph that begins every believer. Uh, in the section, easy ways to lose the blessing. Every believer forms a link in the golden chain connecting the soul to Jesus Christ and is a channel of communication of that light to those who are in darkness. We're talking about easy ways to lose the blessing. Look at, listen to it. Let one, who let one lose his connection with Christ and Satan seizes the opportunity to lead him to dishonor Christ by words, by spirit, by action, and, those, and thus Christ's character is misinterpreted. I ask you, my brother, if the religion of Jesus Christ is not by the excess of the amusements misunderstood, when the Lord gave to Battle Creek the riches of his grace, were there, were, were there those in responsibility who could have directed these souls as to how to improve upon the endowment given in doing good? useful work that would give a change from their studies other than the excitement and emotions caused by their games. This kind of pastime is not improving mind or spirit or manners for uh, the preparation for the scenes of the trial that must soon enter. The superficial piety that passes for religion, oh man, put your foot in that in that Epsom salt right now because she, she on my toes. The superficial piety, oh my God, that passes for religion will be consumed when tried in the furnace. It's an easy way to lose the blessing. 
it is to, to, to keep on playing church, to keep on just going about your life as if you are not a link in that golden chain. You are a link in the chain that leads to heaven. And I'm arm in arm with my sister and brother because I don't want to leave anybody behind. And if I'm walking around, if I'm playing church tonight, my God, help me, Jesus. Holy Ghost. If, if I'm playing church tonight, then God help us to get it right with God. Get it right with him tonight, because as we stated in chapter eight, you don't have as much time as you think you do. I thought I, me, I thought me and my brother would live to be 70 and 80. I thought me and my brother would live until we saw our grandchildren playing together. But my brother was murdered at the age of 32. And because it reminded me that you can, that any time God can call you, you call your number and at any time death can meet you. And it's vitally important that every person we come in contact knows us for who we are. And that is a child connected to God, this golden chain that I'm a link in the chain to heaven. And I'm not going to leave my brother and sister behind. It is, uh, as she said, my God, as she said, a superficial piety that passes for uh, uh, for religion is going to be tried in the fire and it will be consumed. I have to keep it moving, man. I have to keep it moving. I can't read it all for you, but it says the danger of light becoming darkness. We're halfway through chapter nine. And like I said, I want to finish in chapter 10 in the very last section of chapter 10. So uh, if you got your tabs uh, there, then you know where I'm headed. It says uh, uh, danger of light becoming darkness. Uh, skip down. I'm in that chapter. Uh, go ahead. Let's just read it. Let's just read it. It says, the Lord has condensed, uh, con uh, condescended to give you an outpouring of his Holy Spirit. At the camp meetings and our various institutions, a great blessing has been showered upon you. You have been visited by the heavenly messengers of light and truth and power. And it should not be a thought, a strange thing that God should thus bless you. How does Christ subdue his chosen people to himself? It is by the power of his Holy Spirit, for the Holy Spirit, through the scriptures, speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the hearts of men. Before his crucifixion, Christ promised that the comforter should be sent to his disciples. He said, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I not go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, uh, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. When the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He will. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine. He shall receive of mine. Let me make sure there we go. He, uh, he will receive of mine and shall show it unto you. John 16, 7, verse 8, thir verses 13 through 15 uh, is the word that she sh and that she shares. But here's where she says the danger of becoming light, of light becoming darkness. Let's drop down on page 76 to that very last paragraph. It says the period of great spiritual light. If that light is not sacredly cherished and acted upon, it will be turned into a time of corresponding spiritual darkness. The impression made by the Spirit of God, if men do not cherish the sacred impression and occupy holy ground, will fade from the mind. Those who would advance in spiritual knowledge must stand by the very fount of God and drink again and again from the wells of salvation, so graciously open unto them. They must never leave the source of refreshment, but with hearts swelling with gratitude and love at the display of goodness and compassion of God, they must be continual partakers of the living water. It's got to be a constant connection, a daily sacrifice, a daily going, a daily reminder that Christ of what Christ did for us. You know, he said, Take, do this often. Uh, do this. Uh, uh, do this in remembrance of me. Talking about the, uh, the the communion bread and the communion time. That opportunity for us to re be reminded of what He did for us and be uh, don't do away with our sins. To repent, to ask God for forgiveness, and come back and take br the bread of life, His word, and 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 chew on it every day. 
and every day and drink his blood, that reminder that he died for me, you know? And so we can do that. We don't need the emblems. The, em the emblems are just a symbol. But when I study the word of God, when I study the word of God for myself, it is the bread of life. When I talk and think about what Jesus done for me, I'm literally drinking his sacrifice in and reminding myself daily that he is to come and he's changed me from the inside out that I might see him face to face. Amen. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Like I said, I'm going to have a good sermon after this. It says spiritual victory lost to the passions for gains. It says among the students, the spirit of fun and frolic was indulged. They became, they became so interested in playing games that the Lord was crowded out of their minds. And Jesus stood among you in the playground saying, oh, that thou hast not has known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto peace. Luke 19, 42. Yea, also have seen me and believe not. John 6, 36. Yes, Christ revealed himself to you and deep impressions were made as the Holy Spirit moved upon your hearts. But you pursued a course by which you lost these sacred impressions and failed to maintain the victory. And uh, she quotes John 6, uh, 637 on the next page, page 78. All that the Lord giveth me, me shall come to me, and he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That's Jesus speaking. You began to come to Christ, but you did not abide in Christ. You forsook him, and the realization you had had of great favors uh, and blessings, and he had given you was lost from your heart. The question of amusement occupied so large a place in your mind, in your minds, that after the solemn visitation of the Holy Spirit, you entered into a discussion with such a great zeal that all barriers were broken down. And through your passion for games, you neglected to heed the word of Christ. And so she was uh, speaking specifically to the young people uh, and their desire to, um, you know, be involved in these games and sports and things like that. And, and, and I could just go on, on a, I guess you could say, uh, I see it similarly, not necessarily in only the games, you know, and, and it's basically she's that saying, what's taking your, what's got your attention? What's taking up your time? And I, and I got to put my feet in the Epsom salt because I too, I too, uh, 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 am too, I, I enjoy my leisure time. You know, after dealing with all those kids at the schoolhouse and after dealing with uh, Levi and getting him to bed, you know, I had to send him to somebody else's house tonight so that I could be on this call because I, I know how it is to just want to lay around and do nothing and, and instead of in, uh, spending time in the word and spending time. And, and I think that's what she's getting at in this, in this mindset or this idea that the spiritual victory was lost to the passion for games, for, for playing, for, for leisure activity. I don't know what you're binge watching on Netflix. I don't know what you're binge watching on, T, uh, on Hulu and all those streaming apps. I don't know what you're binge watching, but maybe it's taking your attention from God. I'm going to just, I'm just going to leave that right there. I'm not going to mess with it. I got, I got 10 minutes. It's eight o'clock. I told you I would be done at eight, uh, eight, 10 tonight. So bear with me as we uh, close out this great book. It says, uh, four more subsections, was the blessing cherished? It said, goes on to say, let's hop down to the very last passage, the very last uh, par uh, paragraph on page 81 of this subsection, uh, was the blessing cherished? It says, God expected you all to do your best, not to please, amuse, and glorify yourselves, but to honor him in all your ways, returning unto him according to the light and privileges that he had given you through the endowment of his grace. He expected you to testify before heavenly intelligence and to be living witnesses to the world of the power and the grace of Christ. The Lord tested you to see if you would treat his rich blessing as a cheap light matter or regard it as a rich treasure to be handled with reverent awe. If all had treated the gift of God in this manner, for the work was of God, then according to the measure of each one's responsibility, the grace given would have been doubled, uh, as were the talents of him who traded diligently with the Lord's money. And so she's reminding us here that we must cherish this blessing, that we might, we can't just sit around and say, I'm thankful that Jesus died for me, that he's coming again. And I'm every Sabbath, I'm front row center for Sabbath school all the way to one o'clock. I'm there. I'm at my attendance. I got perfect attendance when it comes to attending church. But she's saying, don't, don't, don't just let that be it for you. But did, you should cherish what Christ did for you. And you should love it so much that you got to tell somebody else. All right. And so the next subsection takes us to a blessing turn into a curse. It says, uh, the second paragraph uh, uh, begins on page 81, how may the blessing be turned into a curse? 
by persuading the human agent not to cherish the light or not to reveal to the world that it has been effective in transforming the character. Imbued with the Holy Spirit, the human agent, she's talking about us, consecrates himself to cooperate with divine agencies. He bears the yoke of Christ, lifts his burdens, and, and works in Christ's line to gain precious victories. He walks in the light as Christ is in the light. The scripture is fulfilled to him. We, we all with open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. She quotes 2 Corinthians 3.18, a blessing turned to curse. It can be turned to curse when we do not cherish the light that was given. Again, forgive me because we want to finish this tonight. Be exceedingly careful. Be exceedingly careful. What is this warning to be exceedingly careful? We find it in the very last section on page 83. It says, but because some has misappropriated the rich blessing, turn it to page 84, of heaven shall others deny that Jesus, the Savior of the world, has passed through our churches and that to bless. Let not, not doubt and unbelief question this, for in doing you are treading on dangerous ground. God has given the Holy Spirit to those who have opened the door of their hearts to receive the heavenly gift. But let them not yield to temptation afterward to believe that they have been deceived. And let them not say, because I feel darkness and am oppressed with doubt and never saw Satan's power so manifest as now, therefore I was mistaken. Because the individuals would say, hey man, I, I, this is too much for me to bear. I'm going back to how I used to live. You know what I mean? This, this church life, this, this life in Christ, this life in walking with Christ, this, this idea of, uh, of consecrating my flesh to Christ, of, of forgiving up those things that of, were of my past was too much for me. And I'd rather just be done away. She won't warns you to be careful. So not one expression of doubt. God has wrought for you, bringing sound doctrines of truth into actual contact with the heart. Blessing was given you that it might produce fruit in sound practices and upright character. The last subsection of chapter nine, the sin of rejecting evidence, the sin of rejecting evidence. It says in this, uh, the sin for which first paragraph on page 84, under the subsection, the sin of rejecting evidence, the sin for which Christ reproved Chorazin and Bethsaida was a sin of rejecting evidence that would have convinced them of the truth. Had they yielded to his power, the sin of the scribes and Pharisees was the sin of placing the heavenly work which had been wrought before them in the darkness of unbelief. They saw Jesus and scoffed. They saw Jesus and, 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 and wanted to kill him. Actually, they killed him, right? And it says, so that the evidence, uh, the darkness of unbelief, so that the evidence which should have led into a settled faith was questioned. And the sacred things which have been cherished uh, were regarded as of no value. A fear that the people had permitted the enemy to work along these very lines so that the good which emanated from God, the rich blessing which he has given, have come to be regarded by some as fanaticism. It is this attitude, if this attitude is, pres is preserved, then when the Lord shall again let his light shine upon the people, they will turn from the heavenly illumination saying, I have, I felt the same in 1893 and in some, I, and in whom I have no confidence, I had confidence, said that the work was fanaticism. Will not those who have received the rich grace of God and who take the position that the working of the Holy Spirit was fanaticism be ready to denounce the operations of the Spirit of God in the future and the heart and the heart thus be proof against the solicitations of the still small, small voice. Last sentence, it says, the love of Jesus may be presented to those who thus barricaded themselves against it and exercised no constraining of power upon them. It says, the riches of grace of heaven may be bestowed and yet rejected instead of being cherished and gratefully recognized. With the heart, men, with the heart, men did believe unto righteousness and for a time confession was made unto salvation, but sad to relate, the receiver did not cooperate with heavenly intelligence and cherish the light by working the works of righteousness. We have to continue to, uh, to bear with God and allow him to, uh, to, to lead us in all truth as promised by the Holy Spirit. And in our final chapter, chapter 10, in our final chapter, chapter 10, let's go to the very last subsection. It's uh, the subsection response at the general conference in 1909. This is chapters called the spiritual, the special appeals in public ministry. And it's uh, my final point here. 
uh, is a appeal that she made. And I, I want to end on this note. My brethren and sisters, seek the Lord while he may be found. There is a time coming when those who have wasted their time and opportunities will wish they had sought him. He wants you to keep in the line of reason and in the line of labor. He wants you to go forth to our churches to labor earnestly for him. He wants you to institute meetings for those outside of the churches that they may learn the truth of this last message of warning. There are places where you will be gladly received, where souls will thank you for coming to their help. May the Lord help you to take hold of this work as you have never yet taken hold of it. Will you do this? Will you ever rise to your feet and testify that you will make God your trust and helper? She ends with this prayer, praying, I thank thee, Lord God of Israel. Accept this pledge to this, thy people. Put thy spirit upon them. Let thy glory be seen in them. As they shall speak the word of truth, let us see the salvation of God. And that is how the book, True Revival, ends. And so tonight, if you're listening on Facebook, if you're here, a part of this Zoom room, we thank you for those of you who have stayed on 10 minutes past our time. But I want to encourage you tonight. Uh, I'm going to say a little prayer for you. And I, I'm going to say a little prayer for you and those of you who are watching, because this is vitally important that we understand that the, that that we begin to live out our faith with a sense of urgency. That this that that we uh, we we say every time all the time as Adventists, you know, uh, the word Advent means to look for Christ's return, right? And it, it's important that we realize that Christ is soon to return. Prophecy is being revealed, and I encourage you to invite individuals to come and listen and to study with us as we share with Pastor Kerman Jones two weeks from now, because he's going to open up the Bible in a way I believe that people will be able to receive this truth that sometimes seems obscure and hidden in the word of God, because it's vitally important for us as believers that we connect to uh, not only a, a church family that is a, that is a Bible-believing church, but that we connect with individuals who are seeking him, that we be that link in the golden chain. So let's let's uh, bow our head for a word of prayer, because I just feel the Holy Spirit telling me to pray right now. And I want to pray a prayer over your lives. Uh, for those of you live on Facebook, we thank God for you. And tonight we want to ask him to seal the reading, to seal this study in our heart, to help us take these words and to live by them. Let us pray. God, we thank you because we know that your spirit was with us. We know that these words that were shared were inspired and come from you. God, we read scripture after scripture that reminded us to crucify ourselves and to seek your face daily, that we might be true ambassadors for you, God, that we might be representatives of you everywhere we go. So God, I want to pray a special prayer over the lives of every person under, that, that, that is watching this stream, that is, that is connected to this body of believers at Berean 7 a.m. in the church. God, I pray that you would be with them, that you would empower them to be bold for you, that they would live a life that is pleasing to you in all that they do, that it would be glory to you, God, because it is an urgent matter. God, that we know for ourselves that we have been changed, that we are converted and we're living a life that bears fruit that will remain. God, we thank you now because you already did it, because we prayed it and we know that it is so. God, we thank you. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That is the book, True Revival. We will post uh, our past studies online. Forgive us, uh, we have not posted those last ones. But yeah, as you see, this book ends with a bang. And so we want you to go back, if you haven't read with us each week, go back and read this book. It's about 90 pages, very easy book to read. And I encourage you to study, to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, uh, that the rightly divides the word of truth, amen, because it is now uh, ever uh, upon us to be uh, true light bearers for him. And the time is now 8.11. I told you I would be done with you at 8.10. So tonight, if you want to connect with us, you can connect with us at Houston Berean on Facebook, at Houston Berean on Instagram. You can uh, you know, go to our website, www.bereansdahouston.org to connect with us because we want to hear from you. If this has been a blessing to you, uh, please, you can be a blessing to us. Don't forget about the revival. Begin to invite friends. We'll be passing out handbills here in the next few days. 
to help you to uh, share with your friends and loved ones this awesome revival. We will have a baptism on November 5th. So if you know anyone who may uh, be seeking to come closer to Christ, uh, we don't want, we, we, at, at Berean, we do a little different. You, we, we don't make you know, you don't have to know all 28 fundamental beliefs. You just have to know that you love Jesus and you want to give him your life. And we believe that if you go down in that watery grave with that conviction in your heart, when you come up again, God will begin to make you new as you walk with us, as you journey with us, as you are disciple with us at Berean. So uh, join us on November 5th for a baptism. We already have a few candidates who will be in, uh, who will go down in the water on that day. Uh, again, the Bible app, I'm going to skip that and give you an opportunity to, uh, uh, to bless this ministry so that we can continue to do the great things that we're doing at Berean. Uh, if you would like to go to www.bereansda Houston, you can click on online giving and uh, to Advent Giving, and you can click on Berean SDA Church and you can uh, give a donation to our ministry. Uh, we know that it will go a long way to further the gospel message. But that is my time here tonight. I could go on and on, but I thank God for you, and I ask that you would continue to study with us as we in the weeks to come as God begins to reveal His truth to us through uh, not only through Pastor Norwood, but through uh, Pastor Kerman Jones in our revival. God bless you and have uh, a great, uh, great night. Amen.